Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm so glad that you're here worshiping with us at Barnesville First United Methodist Church. And I'm glad to be stepping in today for Pastor Anne. And she, of course, is at Kairos Ministry today, which Kairos is a word that means God's time. And she is serving in prison on God's time. You know, you just get a pastor in July, and the next thing you know, in October, she's in prison. <laughs> she uh, was there Friday, Saturday, and today. And it is a blessing. She's working with the women's prison. And I saw a picture of the group that's doing it. And let us all keep them in prayer, knowing that they are bringing blessings to those women's lives. And hopefully those lives will be changed because of that. I have a few other announcements. Uh, usually we don't do very many announcements, but because I guess it's me, they reached out and they said, we've got a few announcements, would you mind making them? They are in your bulletin. But the first thing that I'd mention to you is for those of you who are free this afternoon, the acclamation choir led by our own Joan Thomas and starring a few of our choir members, Dave Rumfeld and Ralph Adamson, will be performing again at two o'clock at the R.E. Lee Auditorium in Thomaston. They're doing a wonderful patriotic show called From Sea to Shining Sea. And about 11 of us went Thursday night and we can tell you that it was wonderful and we highly recommend it to you. So this afternoon at 2 in Thomaston. And the other announcement that's coming from the choir is that Joan asked me to remind you, and I know it's awfully early, but to remind you that on December 11th at 5 o'clock there will be the Christmas cantata. Now the reason she wants you to know that is because she wants you to sing with us. And so for those of you who are feeling so moved, uh, every Wednesday evening from 7 to 7.30 in the choir room, we'd love to have you practice the cantata and sing with us on December 11th. And then we'd like you to invite all your friends because Bonnie Minton is putting together a wonderful after-concert uh, fellowship time with food and fun. So please mark your calendars for that. And uh, just wanted to also say that Selfishly, I wanted to say that as the director of the Lay Servant Ministries program, we had a wonderful meeting yesterday in Griffin, and we listened to four candidates that uh, all were wonderful and all were approved to become lay speakers. And two of those names you know. Now, the actual approval will happen in two weeks with the conference committee, but there's one person sitting in our midst and another person who's near and dear to your hearts who will both become lay speakers. I'll name the person first that's not here, and that's the wonderful Shelley Melton. You all know her. And then I'll point to the one man who is with us, and you can give him a hand, and that is the Honorable <laughs> Peter Banks. Thank you very much for that. So now let us turn our hearts and our minds to a time of worship.
Please rise as you're able for the call to worship. We worship because the Lord stood by us on difficult days. We worship because the Lord gives strength. We worship because we have been rescued again and again. Come and worship the Lord who stands with us in our darkest days and promises to be with us to the end. We will worship in hope, seeking eyes to see and hearts to believe in God with us. Now let us profess our faith using the Apostles' Creed found on page 881 in our hymnal. Christians, what do we believe? I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffering under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, and he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God, God Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. soul, the King of Heaven, which can be found on page 66 of your hymn, uh, hymnals. <laughs>
Good morning, guys. How are you today? Good. I'm glad you're here. I have... Oh, good. I'm glad you're here. Have a seat. I have two gifts today. I've got one in this little brown bag, and then I've got one in this bright, colorful bag. Which do you think I should open first? You think the brown one? The present one, the bright and colorful? That's kind of what I was leaning to, right? It's really fun, right? It's got colors. It's big. Let's open it up. Aria, can you open this one up for me? You don't want to? Will you open it? Okay. Tell us what's inside. Hold it up really high when you open it, okay? Well, open it first, and then what's inside of it, hold it up so we can see. What's in there? Okay, birthday pictures. It is napkins and plates. Exciting. That's useful. That could be useful. All right, what's in this one? You want to open it, Walker? Yeah, you got napkins. Cupcakes. That's way more exciting, right? The cupcakes, I think, would be way more exciting than the napkins. So the Bible reminds us a lot that what matters to God is what's on the inside and not really more so focused on what's on the outside, right? It's about the intentions of our hearts, right? I'm going to sit down so I stop shaking. So Jesus told a story in Luke about two men who were praying. The first man, he says his prayer, and it's this loud, boastful prayer, and he's thanking God about all the things that he's done right and just about um, everything that he's done better than other people. And then the other man that Jesus describes, he bowed low. He was full of sorrow and shame for the things he had done and asked God to forgive him. And Jesus said the man who bowed low was, this was the word he used, justified. And that means made righteous rather than the other man. We know God always hears us and listens, but just like the bags that we opened earlier, We shouldn't be so focused on what's on the outside or all of our accomplishments that we have compared to others, right? We should really focus on what's going on inside of our hearts and make sure that we have the right intentions. So why don't we pray? We're going to ask God to help us focus on him, okay? So dear God, thank you for listening to our prayers. Help us to focus on you as the most important things in our life. Amen. All right, we're going to go downstairs and we can have some cupcakes.
Good morning. The morning prayer. At the starting line of this day, we call your name, God of grace. As we run the race you have set before us, help us keep our eyes on your goals, not our own. When we falter, give us fresh strength and courage. When we are fleet-footed, give us you the glory. Keep us from wanting to win at others' expense or to count ourselves better than those at our side. All runners are your children in the race you imagine. Each one is a winner. And now let's pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Time for one of my favorite hymns. If you'll turn in your hymnal to page 395, let us sing, Take Time to Be Holy. Please stand as you are able. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to be generous. Teach us that all that we have been given is just a trust from you. Let us open up our hearts and our hands, and let us give to you and to your kingdom with all goodness, hoping that it will go to make this place the kingdom of heaven on earth. In Jesus' name, amen.
would like to point out to you that our anthem is actually in your bulletin this morning. My mother suggested that we put the lyrics to the anthem in the bulletin because she liked it so much. So I thought I'd point that out to you. It was written recently by Eric Dewar, and Eric Dewar actually serves as the music of ministry at a church, and he's written a lot of music which he makes freely available to anyone who wants to have his music in their churches, which I thought was lovely. As we uh, move into the pastoral prayer, let me call your attention to the list of folks on the prayer list. Uh, there are a couple people that I'll call to your attention. I talked to Charles Glass this morning, and he tells me that his mother, Sarah, is at Brightmore and will probably be there for the next few weeks. She's recovering from surgery for a broken arm, so please keep Sarah Glass in your prayers. And there are many others that I would call to your attention that are also in the prayer list. I also want to keep Bob Wallace in our prayers. Bob has hurt his back again and will be facing surgery, I think, again in the near future. You know many names of those that you are in prayer for. So let us just take about oh, a few moments and let's close our eyes and silently let us pray for those who are on our hearts and on our minds. Heavenly Father, you, the great healer of all, we call upon you this morning and ask you to be with those who are suffering, with those who are ill, with those who are ill in body and those who are ill in spirit. Please be with those who are struggling with family issues, with employment issues, with all the ways that you know that we struggle. Please be with them and give them your healing touch. And Father, empower us to know what to do and what to say. And please be within us so that we may bring healing to those people and bring healing to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was 16 years old, I spent the summer in Scotland with my Aunt Jean and my Uncle Alf. They were my grandmother's sister and uh, brother-in-law. Now, right before I arrived in Scotland, my Aunt Jean inherited a liquor store. <laughs> now that was not just surprising, that was downright shocking. Because my Aunt Jean was a teetotaler. She didn't touch a drop of alcohol, and she was full of contempt for anyone who did drink. And yet every morning, she'd get up that summer, and she and her friend Rose would sit in the back room of the liquor store, drinking their tea and making comments about anyone who happened to come into the liquor store to buy liquor. Aunt Jean and Rose were very sure that they were morally superior. They were righteous. They were holy. Well, by comparison, anyway. They were certainly glad they weren't like those poor sinners that drank liquor, even if they were benefiting by the sale of it. Now, my husband, Mark, he used to be a smoker. 30 years ago, when we were living in Philadelphia, he decided to give up smoking. Now, he didn't even tell me he was doing it. He just gave up smoking cold turkey. So for about a week, he looked like he had the flu. He was all <laughs> clammy and white and ghastly looking. And then after that period of time, he was no longer a smoker. Now, Mark didn't go from being a smoker to a non-smoker. Mark went from being a smoker to an anti-smoker. And so now all of a sudden when we would go into restaurants, and you know back in those days, 30 years ago, they would have smoking sections and non-smoking sections. Oh no, Mark wasn't just going to sit in the non-smoking section. He was going to sit as far away from those nasty smokers as he could possibly sit. He was, well, he was holy by comparison. I am fat. 
I have been thin, but for most of my life, I have been on a roller coaster of dieting. You know, it used to be a whole lot easier for me to lose weight. And now, I don't know about you, but now that I'm in my late 60s, it seems to be only easy for me to gain weight. Now, on those rare occasions when I am disciplined and when I have lost a great deal of weight, I find myself getting <laughs> self-righteous about it. I look over in the grocery store to some fatty putting candy in their cart, and I think to myself, I'm so glad that I'm no longer tempted by candy. I puff up with my self-righteousness about my willpower. That is, uh, until my willpower gives out and I'm back to eating cookies, bread, and spaghetti. And in those brief moments of thinness, I, well, I'm holy by comparison. I also have a confession to make. I told Lynn this in the office. I hope all of you have bought candy for the fall festival on the 31st. I did and opened it. <laughs> I said to Lynn, I said, I hope they won't mind if mine has a clip on it. It's easy for us humans to decide who's better and who's worse. We do it all the time. We judge, almost like breathing. And we thank God for the blessings and gifts we've received that set us apart and, hmm, set us above other human beings. And isn't it amazing how often when we think about sin, we often think about what someone else is doing. Well, leadership coach and author John Maxwell tells a story about a grandpa who was visiting with his grandchildren. And every afternoon, grandpa would take a nap. So one day, the grandkids decided to play a joke on him. They put Limburger cheese on his mustache. So when he woke up, he started sniffing and he said, this room stinks. Then he went into the kitchen and he said, it stinks in here too. And then he went outside for a breath of fresh air and after a minute he said, the whole world stinks. Grandpa could smell the stink, but he couldn't recognize that the stink was on him. Today's lectionary reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. It's one of Jesus' many parables. Now, according to the dictionary definition, parables are short allegorical stories designed to teach a truth, religious principle, or moral lesson. But when Jesus tells a parable, it is so much more. You know, parables aren't like Aesop's fables. Uh, those Aesop's fables we learned at school that have a simple moral at the end. How many of you remember Aesop's fables? I remember a few of them, like the tortoise and the hare, where we learned that slow and steady wins the race. Or the other one that I think of is the boy who cried wolf, and we are taught at the end of that, a liar will not be believed even when he speaks the truth. Well, parables aren't like Aesop's fables. The moral of the story is just not so obvious. Parables are often paradoxical. They require us to think, to pray, and to challenge our assumptions. Today's parable is about a Pharisee and a tax collector. We're going to hear the story from the Gospel of Luke, and I want to let you know, I'm, I've got it open to the Bible, but I'm going blind in my old age. So although I will hold the Bible, which I will hold to my heart, because this Bible is my grandmother's Bible. So I will hold it to the parable, but I'll actually read it off here. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, and one a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, 
that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus is the word of God for the people of God. I'm sure you've heard this parable before and have been taught to ascribe the worst possible motives to the Pharisee. But Jesus' audience wouldn't have assumed that the Pharisee was a bad guy. No, they would have pictured him as a model citizen, a decent, upstanding religious man, just like us. The Pharisees, they were good people, and they knew they were good people. They made a valiant attempt to obey all the laws. They prayed morning and evening. They tithed to the synagogue. They fasted. And they honored all of the Jewish traditions and the high holy days. Perhaps we know someone like that. Perhaps we are someone like that sometimes. We do like to consider ourselves to be righteous, don't we? Well, the Pharisees, though, could be downright hypocritical, something we church folks also sometimes fall prey to today. Now, in the New Testament, a few Pharisees come across pretty well. There was Nicodemus, who originally came to see Jesus at night, but then later he brought all kinds of ointments to prepare Jesus' body for death and then buried him with Joseph of Arimathea. And then we have the Pharisee Gamaliel, who was Paul's mentor, who stood up for the disciples after Jesus' resurrection. They were healing the sick in Jesus' name, and he spoke on their behalf. They were irritating the Sanhedrin, and he stood up for them. And yet, Jesus has some rather harsh words for the Pharisees. In Matthew 23, 2 through 4, he says, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads, and they put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. It's possible that Jesus might say the same about us on occasion, There are times, perhaps, when we may fail to practice what we preach. There may even be times that we could create a set of rules that are cumbersome to obey and then fault others for falling short. I wonder, do we ever exclude people from the church or from our circle of friends because we decide that they are breaking the rules, rules that we deem to be important, while at the same time we're busily discarding rules that we deem to be unimportant. And what about this tax collector? Well, he was the stereotypical sinner. He would be hated by his countrymen, his fellow Jews. He had sold out. Tax collectors used to bid for the right to collect taxes for Rome, and then they would add on to that so that when they were collecting the taxes, they would take as much as they could possibly get to line their own pockets. Now, the disciple Matthew was a tax collector, as was our short little friend Zacchaeus, who climbed the tree to see Jesus, and Jesus went home and ate with him. You know, Jesus made a habit of eating with sinners, those folks that we might not want around our own tables. Jesus just kept extending his circle to include everyone, just as surely as we draw a circle that excludes someone, Jesus will widen the circle to include them. So now we get into comparisons. Do you think perhaps that Jesus favored tax collectors over Pharisees? Hmm, I wonder. You know, many times when you hear this story told, this parable, the preacher will create an either-or scenario out of the parable. You're either the Pharisee who is self-righteous and congratulatory and downright selfish, or you are the tax collector who recognizes the sinfulness of your ways and pleads with God for mercy. 
But perhaps, just perhaps, these two characters in the parable, the Pharisee and the tax collector, both represent us, depending on our state of mind, our mood, and what's going on in any given moment in our lives. And when we face our inner Pharisee and our inner tax collector in the mirror, we know, we realize, we feel that God's grace is freely offered to all. We are called to recognize his grace and to gratefully accept it. According to the theologian Diana Butler Bass, she said, Pharisee and tax collector alike side by side, gifted with mercy. We might not like it, but God is a wildly gifting God, throwing manna from heaven on everyone, whether they have been faithful or not. We stand alongside each other in humble gratitude, no matter the circumstance. So what is this parable about? Well, it may not be about which character is superior. Certainly, the Pharisee feels superior to the tax collector, and as we read the parable, we might think that the tax collector has a leg up in the prayer department on this particular occasion. But maybe, maybe the parable points a finger at you and at me. Perhaps it's a lesson about humility, about prayer, and maybe even a lesson about connection. We've all fallen short and missed the mark. We might read this parable as an invitation to set aside our pride, our judgment, and to walk alongside one another, helping one another, cheering one another on in this path of life. Daryl Bach, who's a New Testament theologian, he points out the difference between pride and humility this way. Pride preaches merit. Humility pleads for compassion. Pride negotiates as an equal, humility approaches in need. Pride separates us by putting down others. Humility identifies with others, recognizing we all have the same need. Pride destroys through its alienating self-service. Humility opens doors with its power to sympathize with the struggle we share. Pride turns up its nose. Humility offers an open and lifted up hand. When we pray, we are called to approach God with humility. None of us has a monopoly on righteousness. Jesus commands us to love one another, not to judge one another, and certainly not to separate from one another. As the body of Christ, we are one. We are connected. We are each different. We are each unique, which is a blessing, not a curse. Let's celebrate our diversity and love one another, not choose which of our many differences are the most off-putting or the least desirable. We don't need to jockey for the best seat at the table. There's plenty of room for all of us. The disciples knew they had a lot to learn about prayer. They saw how Jesus prayed and how he prayed constantly, and they asked Jesus to teach them to pray. And he gave them the most beautiful prayer that we've said today, the Lord's Prayer. Jesus taught them about prayer and about community. He taught them about relationship and about obedience. He taught them how to bring about the kingdom of heaven on earth and how to become living prayers. He taught them how to grow in holiness and how to do it without making comparisons. Nadia Bowles Weber, I don't know if you've heard of her, she's a bit controversial. She's a tattooed and outspoken Lutheran pastor and she serves a church called the House of All Sinners and Saints. She says this about prayer. The very prayer Christ prayed for us, the Lord's Prayer, is one of connection. None of us is alone. We are connected by prayer to each other and to God. It hurts sometimes. But the more you see suffering and injustice about you, 
the more you pray, and the more you pray, the more connected you are to that suffering. And the more connected that you become to that suffering, the more you are connected to the crucified and risen Christ. For these silken threads of prayer, which connect us to God and to one another, and even to our enemies, are how God is stitching our broken humanity back together. So church, pray without ceasing, and do not lose heart. Isn't that beautiful? I think it's good news for us. We are not alone. Prayer can connect us. And prayer opens our eyes to the suffering and injustice. It softens our heart and it propels us into action to help, to support one another, to do justice, to show kindness, and to walk humbly with our God. Prayer is a lot more than what we say. It's what we do. We pray for one another and then we are transformed into living prayers as God sends us forth to do his will. In this parable, and in life itself, we walk side by side. The Pharisee and the tax collector, the teetotaler and the drinker, the smoker and the non-smoker, the obese and the thin. None of us becomes holy by comparison. In Galatians 3, 28, Paul says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all one in Christ Jesus, for we, all of us, are the body of Christ. As our hymn today, Take Time to Be Holy, says, Speak oft with the Lord, abide in him always, and feed on his word. Make friends with God's children, Help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessing to seek. There's hope in the gospel and in this parable, even for self-righteous people like me, who can smell the stink but not realize we might just be the one that is smeared with the Limburger cheese. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, teach us how to pray with humility. Connect us to you and to one another. May our prayers involve our whole being, not just our mouths. Soften our hearts and allow us to feel one another's griefs and to recognize the injustices of this world. Create an empathy within us that leads to action, propelling us forward to be living prayers and transforming us into kingdom builders who live to do your will and abide in your heavenly kingdom now and always. In Jesus' name, amen. And now for our closing hymn, our hymn of reflection is number 670. Please stand as you are able and let us sing, Go Forth for God.
And now let us go forward. Let us go forth for God. Let us go out into the world and take Christ out into the world with us so that we may be Christ for the world. Amen. Amen.